is Tim Beasley, and you're watching my top 5 games of 2015. This list won't include re-releases or games such as Bloodborne or Witcher 3, because I didn't get a chance to play them this year. I'm sure they'd be somewhere on this list had I played them. The games you're gonna see on this list are games that I've beaten or played a significant amount of. And without any further ado, let's start things off with number 5. What can I say about M++? Um, it's a game for masochists. You are playing as a ninja stick figure with a lust for gold. That's pretty much the basic premise of the game. The closest thing you can compare something like M++ is Super Meat Boy. They are both fast-paced physical platformers with minimalistic art styles to them, and they are both relentlessly difficult. Stages can go from super easy and fun to brutally difficult and frustrating, but in a way that's kinda why I like the game so much. This game requires a lot of delicate movement and button presses. You have to become one with the character you're controlling. Know what kind of jumps you can make, what kind of tight holes you can squeeze through, and where you can land without dying. The game has those moments where you jump in there and hold your breath hoping that you'll survive when you hit the ground. But once you get used to the way your character moves, you can effortlessly swish through some of the levels, and that can feel good sometimes. You can always add an extra level of difficulty by trying to grab all the gold in the level. Trying to get those all gold clear batches can turn short simple levels to gruelingly long endurance tests. The game has 2360 metanic created levels and users keep creating more with the level creator. My two main issues are how there isn't any online play, even though Plus had it, and how the game looks. I like the style of the game, but staring at some of those color combinations can destroy your eyes after a few minutes. Luckily the game does offer a lot of options to mess around with, including changing the color scheme, freely picking what song you want to listen to, and many many other options that help you make the game fit to your preferences, Include that's a number wang. All in all, it's a fun, fast-paced, challenging game that's all about the gameplay, and it offers a good amount of content. When you want to make the little Marius, you gotta be willing to shove a mushroom in the pipe. I feel like this game was long in the making, especially if you look at all the kinds of Mario ROM hacks online. People have been craving for a Mario game where they can make their own levels. Why this particular creation game works so well is because Wii U gamepad is made for this. In many other games like N++, creating levels takes a long time and has you going through tons of menus. In Super Mario Maker, making levels is easy, fun and intuitive. There are four different game styles to choose from, each with six different aesthetic styles. The game style you choose will define the rules for that level. You can do all the stuff you see in regular 2D Mario and much more. Creating levels can be just as fun as playing the levels, partly thanks to stuff like this. You have a good selection of tools at your disposal, and you can make new types of enemies and obstacles by mixing them. I found myself constantly being surprised by what kind of contraptions you can make in this. It's the same reason why something like Little Big Planet is impressive and fun. Even if you're not into the creation of levels yourself, you'll still see other people make some incredible stuff. Super Mario Maker is one of those games that lives or dies by its user-generated content, but the amount of creativity and versatility I've seen in the stages is impressive. You have your artistic levels, quiz levels, incredibly hard levels, levels that complete themselves, there's just so much variation in the kind of levels you'll come across. You can play levels by selecting them yourself, or playing 100 or 10 Mario Challenge that will choose random levels for you. 100 Mario Challenge has 3 difficulty levels, and it's pretty good at telling which levels are hard and which ones are easy. And if a level happens to be too difficult, you can skip it. The game also has amiibo support, which allows you to play as different characters, but you don't need the amiibos to unlock them. You can unlock the amiibo costumes and many other costumes just by playing. It just takes a while. Not much more I can say. You know, it's Mario. It's, it's fun. It's a game that speaks for itself. We hold our rifles in missing hands. 
we stand tall on missing legs. This pain is ours, and no one else's. Yup, it's Phantom Pain. It was obvious from the start this game was going to be somewhere on this list. The reason why it's not any higher on this list is because it actually ended up being rather disappointing. This game was marketed as being the last missing piece in the Metal Gear Saga, where they show Big Boss's downfall and how he finally forms Outer Heaven and becomes the villain we all know and love from Metal Gear 1. It was supposed to be Dark Quest for Revenge. You were supposed to be able to go back to Camp Omega and some serious taboos were going to be tackled. None of that really happened. Instead, what we got was a new breed of stealth, where long cutscenes have been turned into cassette tapes, nanomachines to parasites, and more linear gameplay has been replaced with an open world. Doesn't feel like this is over. The player has plenty of vehicles and other means of traveling in this open world, but why would you even do that? The world is dead and empty. Same goes for Mother Base. It's beautiful to look at, I'll give it that, but there's nothing to do outside of collecting materials and every now and then meeting soldiers at outposts and fighting them, but that's about it. What the game does offer is a lot of options and customization possibilities, varying from weapons to vehicles, body equipment, your emblem, base color and what you'll be wearing on the field. And all of this is reflected in cutscenes, which is nice. You can choose to go into missions with guns blazing or have a more tactical and stealthy approach. Whatever approach you decide to go with, you're gonna run to the same type of mission over and over again. Go here, eliminate slash rescue this person or go and retrieve something. It doesn't help that Act 2 is almost entirely replaying missions you've already done, just on higher difficult level. This game takes a lot from Peace Walker, all the way from mission structure to base building. Just like in Peace Walker, you'll be spending a lot of time fortuning soldiers to your mother base and later improving your mother base through menus. Something else this game takes from Peace Walker. An awful story. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong, Peace Walker had some fantastic moments in the story, but overall it was pretty bad and somehow... This ends up being way, way worse? Most of the MGS games tend to have good stories, and this being the last Kojima-directed MGS game, I had high hopes. Another thing that ended up being really disappointing, the characters. Ocelot wasn't triple-crossing anyone, Skullface turned out to be a Resident Evil villain, Liquid was simply an angsty teenager, Venom Snake was quiet little goody two-shoes, and Quiet? She's just an awful character for the most part. Huey you hate him, but it's for a good reason. He, he was alright. It was Kazuhiro Miller who ended up being the true star of the show. This is the enemy! And he's here on his knees! Uh, I mean, look. The game is technically impressive. It looks beautiful. But a lot of the things that make MGS MGS just weren't there. It felt it was missing something. And I'm not talking about the cutout Mission 51 or the Mysterious Chapter 3. The feeling, it's its its like a limb that has been torn off. Even MGO3 didn't manage to pull me in the same way MGO2 did. But despite all that, I still had a lot of fun playing it. I mean, it got on the list, didn't it? This one actually ended up getting a lot of negativity towards it. Some of the complaints are valid and some... not so much. If you've played Oblivion, Fallout 3 or Skyrim, you know what to expect. It's another Bethesda created open world RPG with some new things added in there. What I love about the Bethesda created open worlds is that everything seems to make sense. When you're roaming through the wasteland, you come across raider camps, cities, buildings taken over by super mutants, caravans, all manner of places and people. Even though the world has gone through nuclear devastation, there's still plenty of life in the world. For example, you walk into a building and there's proof all over the building that stuff has happened here. People used to live here, or work here or whatever. You know, there's a reason for these environments to exist. Not only that, but you're constantly running into mutated animals, synths or other enemies and this all happens naturally. You could be having a conversation with another person and suddenly someone opens fire at you. 
the way this all works is so organic and it feels natural, like a world that can function whether I'm there or not. It's a place where you can get lost in. You can play good 10 hours straight and not even really notice it. There's simply so much stuff to do. Roam around the wasteland, loot stuff, fight enemies, play holotapes, customize your equipment, build settlements, join factions, all kind of stuff. You can also get a lot of companions to aid you in your travels around the wasteland, each with their own personalities, skills, likes and dislikes. You can equip them with whatever clothes and weapons you like. I know many people can't stand them, but uh, I don't mind them hanging around with me too much. I mean, they haven't really gotten in my way, they aid you in battle, provide commentary on what's going on and help you carry loot you collect on your journeys. Another thing I like is how they took more of a Diablo-style approach to the loot system. How you encounter legendary enemies and get unique weapon drops with special properties tied to them, that is just something I personally grew up after. One thing I wasn't expecting to enjoy but ended up liking a whole hell of a lot is the settlement building. You can build settlements all over the vast Boston wasteland, and you need plenty of resources to make it happen. Same goes for enhancing your gear, whether it's guns, clothes or power armor. You need a lot of junk to start creating stuff. Now every item in the world can be broken down to resources, like adhesive, circuitry, wood, which then can be used to create stuff. Now even the junk in the world has an actual purpose. This stuff is scattered everywhere in the wasteland, which by the way isn't small at all, despite what some people are saying. You're not just strolling around outdoors all the time, you go to metro tunnels, buildings, vaults, all over the place. I'd personally have a small, more dense open world with stuff to do in than a huge empty dead kitty litter box, but that's just me. Where the game does show its flaws are mainly the stripped down RPG elements, some of the limited dialogue options, bugs and the engine is starting to show its age. I haven't really encountered many glitches or bugs myself and the few minor ones that I've seen I've been able to laugh off, so that really hasn't hindered my game experience. With this game I feel they took two steps forward and one step back. I don't think the game is as bad as some people make it out to be. The game has its issues, but I still feel the joy I get from playing this outweighs the negatives. Let's go, boy. That's right, it's mother freaking Undertale. I bet there's gonna be three types of people watching this video. People who know what this game is and why it's on the list. People who know what this game is and believe it shouldn't be on the number one place. And people who don't have the slightest clue what this game is. If you happen to be a person in the latter category and you're into video games, I heavily recommend you get this game. It doesn't matter what kind of piece of crap PC or laptop you own, the game is gonna run on it, I guarantee it. Not just that, but it's also dirt cheap. And if $10 is too big of an investment for you, there's a free demo you can try out. I'm not gonna lie, it took a couple of hours before the game really got its hooks into me. And when it did, it did so with the fiery passion of Thousand Suns. The story follows a kid who has fallen from a mountaintop into ruins inhabited by monsters who have been sealed in by a magic barrier. Now the fallen human is trying to make his way back home from the ruins, meeting all kind of creatures on his journey. In most games you'd be required to fight the monsters you encounter, but here you don't have to. It's a game where you don't have to kill anyone. Every time you encounter monsters, you can either fight them or spare them. Both options are just as valid, and your actions shape the future. Even though this game has a RPG structure, the battles are more like playing a bullet hell game. The game features a very unique battle system that requires good dodging abilities and creative solutions to defeat your opponents. The game has a wide variety of monsters you encounter and it's constantly doing something new and fresh. Where this shines is the boss battles. This game has such a firm grasp on what boss battles should be. When you meet a boss, it's an event. All the bosses are different, not just with their personalities, but how you're supposed to fight them. All of them have special abilities that change up how the battles work and some of these bosses, they really give you a run for your money. Outside of battles, you're constantly going to new areas, meeting new monsters and solving new puzzles. It never feels like you're doing the same thing. Even if you've beat the game, you can have a completely different experience the second time around depending on your actions. 
the game can go from being absolutely hilarious to extremely dark in just seconds. It's just... <sighs> What can I say? The game has a well-realized world, endearing characters, unique battle system, surprisingly good story and a fantastic soundtrack. Undertale is a prime example and a nice reminder that you don't need great graphics or incredible complexity to the gameplay in order to make a great game. Honestly, I could keep on going for hours as for why I enjoy the game so much, but instead I'll give a condensed version. Undertale has charming characters, funny writing, great attention to detail, good music, tons of replay value, unique battle system, and simply has a lot of innovation and creativity in an industry that is slowly growing more stale with the kind of products that it produces. The game is impressive considering that it has been practically made by one person, but it's not the greatest game I've made. There's very few bad things that I could say about this game, but they do exist. With that being said, the game got on this list for a reason. I feel it's not just a game, it's an experience. Something you really should experience for yourself, and form your own opinions of the game. For me, personally, the experience was very positive, and it managed to give me the kind of feelings that you don't get with every single game. And with that, I award Undertale with my Game of the Year award! <laughs>